talk about the Progressive Era. We began a little bit of the Progressive Era in the previous lecture on uh, westward expansion. Towards the end of westward expansion, towards the end of the frontier, uh, the farmers had settled so much of the, the area and had uh, began farming the area so much that by 1890, the Census Bureau uh, actually said the frontier was closed. There was no new frontier uh, for America. Um, but the farmers started running into a lot of problems, and that gave uh, rise to their involvement in what was called the populist movement or the populist party. And that's going to become part of the progressive era, but it's not going to be all of the progressive era. So let's take a look at the progressive era, in, which is uh, America seeking reforms in the early 20th century, late 19th century. You'll see a picture in the bottom corner there of Theodore Roosevelt. He was president from 1901 to 1909. Um, the height of progressivism is under his presidency. Uh, he is probably the best known face of progressivism um, and, or of the progressive era, and we will talk quite a bit about him. All right, so where does progressivism come from? Well, um, post-Civil War America, um, especially post-Reconstruction America, had become a booming time. It was a great time for new industries like the cattle industry, meat packing industry. I didn't mention that much in the last video. Uh, your book does talk about it, though, but uh, the meat packing industry becomes very uh, profitable um, as the cattle industry increases. Um, in the beginning, uh, farming is very profitable, especially wheat crops. Um, indust and industrialization takes off. Um, but as time goes on, work conditions, women and children's rights, economic and uh, environmental issues and reforms are going to become a problem. Social welfare is going to become an issue that's on a lot of people's minds. And, uh, some of this is going to be in influenced by the social gospel movement and by the populist movement. The social gospel movement, uh, we actually talked about during uh, a little bit during the uh, Manifest Destiny and during the uh, pre-Civil War time, and that was the idea during the Second Great Awakening that um, because of everything that God has done for us, it is our job to try to improve society, that if we are a good Christian um, following in the example of Jesus, we should be trying to contribute to our society, spread the gospel, but also improve the lives of others um, by showing them the love of Christ uh, through helping to improve their lives. The progressive movement impacts all levels of government, and it becomes uh, a huge influencer in all levels of government. So it has uh, four goals of reform. It wants to protect the social welfare, which is the governmental provision of economic assistance to persons in need. This is when the idea that it's the government's responsibility to help those who are less fortunate and in need, uh, this is when that really becomes prevalent. It wants to promote moral improvement, changes in character. Um, there had been some moral degradation that was going on um, beforehand, and, and there, there, this idea that there needed to be improvement in the morality of people um, was becoming very prominent. In order to create economic reform, government change in policies towards businesses. Um, it said that pure capitalism was, um, was too evil, that, that the um, people would, would take it too far and would not share the profit, um, would become too greedy. Um, and, they, and they pointed to the Gilded Age as examples of that. And that it would foster efficiency, the effective use of resources. So to protect the social welfare, the industrialization had been unregulated. The government was not involved in industries at all. There were no safety standards. There were no rules or regulations about um, hygiene or cleanliness or anything like that. And employers didn't really feel a responsibility to the worker. There were so many workers that if a worker got hurt or sick or, or didn't like conditions or, or left for any reason at all, there were plenty of workers to replace them. So there was no uh, responsibility that the employer felt to the employee. Settlement houses and churches served the community um, in an effort to try and help those in need, but they weren't enough. Um, there was always more need than there was help. 
The YMCA and Salvation Army took on service roles. They really got their beginnings um, during this time period in, in an effort to help those less fortunate. Moral development, promoting moral development. Some reformers felt that the answer to society's problems was personal behavior. Um, people needed to behave better as individuals, and that would fix the problems of society. Um, and one of the big reforms at the time was prohibition. Uh, drinking was extremely heavy at the time. Um, and the idea was that um, uh, the drinking had been heavy for a long time. We had we'd already talked about the temperance movement and how the idea was that because of how much drinking was going on, uh, gallons and gallons and gallons of, of alcohol was being consumed by individuals every year. Um, the temperance movement had come about. We need to we need to taper that off. You need to be temperate in your consumption of alcohol. Well, temperance hadn't worked, so prohibition comes about. The idea that we just need to prohibit any type of alcohol at all. Alcohol is completely evil and serves no useful purpose and so therefore should be gotten rid of. Comes about during this time as part of the moral development. And group, groups that wish to ban alcohol included group like the, groups like the Women's Christian Temperance Union. Um, a lot of times it was women who were pushing for this simply because the, they were suffering the most um, from it. Economic reform, this comes from the Panic of 1893. Americans began to question the capitalistic system, economic system. Workers began to embrace socialism. Socialism was really uh, running rampant um, through Eastern Europe at the time. Uh, a lot of people were fleeing socialism um, in Eastern Europe and immigrating to the United States uh, because they didn't want to be part of what was happening in Eastern Europe, but they brought some of the ideas of the socialistic teachings to the United States and some workers started to embrace them. Eugene Debs actually organized the American Socialist Party in 1901. Muckrackers began to criticize big business. Uh, journalists known as muckrackers exposed corruption in business. Um, it's a name that was first given to American writers as they exposed uh, corruption in the 20th century, scandals in business and politics. Uh, they felt, muckrackers felt a um, duty to expose these things. They felt an ethical standard uh, to report things the way that they were happening and, and to expose these problems. Ida Tarbell exposed the Standard Oil Company for its questionable methods of eliminating the competition. Lincoln Steffens photographed living conditions in the slums in the late 1800s and early 1900s so that people would actually see what was going on. Um, mag the number of magazines, newspapers, and books increased greatly, um, and more people were able to read, so more people were able to read what was being written, so the muckrackers had a greater impact on society. Some would view Michael Moore as a modern muckracker, some would not. You can make your own uh, decision on that. Fostering efficiency was the fourth goal. Many of the leaders uh, in the progressive movement uh, put their faith in scientific principles to make society better. Um, this is uh, an offshoot of the Enlightenment period um, from the 16 and 1700s. Um, in industry, Frederick Taylor had used time and motion studies to improve factory um, efficiency. He had figured out ways to make the industrial process more efficient. Taylorism um, becomes an industry fad that factories use uh, so that they can make the completion of tasks quicker um, and, and much more efficient. Henry Ford is going to come up with the assembly line during this time period. Um, okay, so cleaning up local government. Somebody once said all, uh, all politics is local. And what they mean by that is that's where you have the most influence is on your local government. And so reform efforts began at the local level. This came from a desire to make government more efficient and more responsive to its citizens. Uh, some people wanted to limit immigrants' influence on the local governments. Um, they wanted to limit immigrants' ability to take jobs. Jobs were scarce at the time. There were more people that, uh, who available to work than there were jobs. Um, and and uh, a lot of people blamed that on the huge influx of Im immigrants that were coming into the nation at the time. Um, and, and they said that those immigrants were taking all the jobs. They wanted to remedy that. 
They wanted to regulate big business. They said big business was a problem. It was evil. It took advantage of the worker. Um, under the progressive Republican leadership of Robert La Follette, Wisconsin led the way. Wisconsin became uh, kind of the ideal. People looked to what Wisconsin did to figure out what they needed to do, and it became known as the Wisconsin idea. And, and notice that progressivism is not just Democratic or just Republican, although Republic, more Republicans tended to be progressive than Democrats. Working children, uh, there was an effort to protect them. Uh, many children didn't go to school. They had to work to help the family. And many companies wanted to employ children and women more than they wanted to employ the men. Men got paid more than women. Women got paid more than children. So the more children you could hire to do a job, the less expensive it was. Um, nearly every state had limited or banned child labor by 1918, but it was a long process. And one of the reasons they wanted to do this was because of the safety of children. Children were getting hurt or killed in um, working in factories. You can see this little boy has no shoes on, but he's, he's standing on the equipment. It would be very easy for his toes or his feet to get caught up in the machinery. Um, and this was common. Plus children were working 10, 14 hour, 16 hour days. Uh, lack of school, lack of sleep, uh, lack of nutrition. Uh, incidentally, this is about the time, uh, the late, late 1800s, it's about the time that the idea of Sunday school comes about. And Sunday school was actually put out in uh, churches, not necessarily to teach Bible stories to little children, but Sunday was the only day that the factories were closed. And so families and children could come to church on Sunday. Sunday school was put forth uh, to teach the children to read and basic math skills so they would have at least a basic education since most of them were working and could not go to school. So there were efforts to limit hours for working. The Supreme Court of the states and have put forth laws and, and supported laws that reduced women's hours of work and children's hours of work, although by 1918 most child labor was outlawed. Um, Progressives also um, were successful in getting workmen's, workmen's compensation or workers' compensation for families of workers that had been injured. Um, up until that point, if you got hurt on the job, and, and some of the injuries on the job were, were pretty significant. People would lose limbs, especially in meatpacking plants. Um, if you, but if you were hurt on the job, that was just your tough luck and your family had to figure out how to get along without you. The company did not have to pay anything to you or help you out in any way. Um, progressives are able to get legislation passed uh, that changes that, and it's called workers' compensation. Political machines were a problem. We talked about political machines during the Gilded Age. They were still a problem during the progressive era. This is a group that controls the activities of a political party. They controlled a large number of the immigrant voters. That's one reason that um, many of the populists wanted there to be less immigrants because the machines were very easily able to control the immigrants because the immigrants had the greatest need for housing and, and jobs and that, which made them vulnerable to the machines. They provided housing to the immigrants when they came to the city. They helped them find food, get jobs. Uh, they even helped them out financially at special holidays to make sure they had what they needed or, or money to celebrate the holiday. Election reform was huge on their list. Um, the, they wanted to influence, uh, or they wanted to remove the influence of the political machines, and, and progressives really began to do this. Um, they're able to do this by uh, changing the voting methods to secret ballot. Before the progressive era, when you went to vote, you had to voice your vote. You had to give your name and say how you wanted to vote or who you wanted to vote. Um, secret ballot comes about, and now nobody knows how you voted. Uh, Americans um, view voting as a very private thing now, but it was not so before the progressive era. Also, the ideas of a referendum and a recall or an initiative came about. Um, and those are defined in your book. Um, they're very, uh, very new ideas to this time. Um, they're adopted on the local and state level. They're not adopted on the national level. Citizens could pet petition to get initiatives um, 
on the ballot, which are things that they wanted made into laws, if they, if they had enough people sign a petition, uh, they could get this, uh, this question on the ballot for, for citizens to vote on. Uh, direct primaries started to take the place of caucuses. Caucuses would be a, a meeting of the party leaders to decide who would be the nominee for political office. Direct primary, primaries would be the citizens uh, going to the polls and voting on who they wanted the nominee to be. And, and those direct primaries start to take the place of these caucuses. And in 1899, Minnesota passed the first statewide primary system. The election of senators changes um, in 1913 with a constitutional amendment. There's actually going to be four constitutional amendments in the progressive era, and at the end of the, the PowerPoint, I will review those amendments for you. But in 1913, the 17th Amendment is uh, uh, ratified and added to the Constitution, which changes the election of senators from the state legislatures to uh, senators being elected directly by the people. Now, uh, as I said in the previous lecture, the Founding Fathers had made the Senate um, elected by the legislatures of the states in order to give the states a voice in the, na in the national government. The House of Representatives was supposed to be the voice of the people. The Senate was supposed to be the voice of the state. Um, and therefore, the ideas, the rights, um, of both groups would be represented. Um, but in 1913, there was really a push up until 1913 after the Civil War to get senators elected directly by the people. And that happens with the addition of the 17th Amendment. Women in public life. That begins to change. Now, the poster here is of Rosie the Riveter, We Can Do It. That is World War II era. Um, that is not from the Progressive Era, but the idea starts in the Progressive Era. Before the Civil War, women stayed at home mostly. They devoted their time to the home and family. Um, social occasions were about the only time that they went out. But in the 19th and 20th century, women were much more visible in the workforce. They took more jobs. Um, now, they were specific jobs for women, store clerks, or they work in, fa in factories. Um, sometimes they were teachers. Um, but they would, they would work, um, and they had more of a presence in public life. And we actually see this reflected in women's clothing. Up until this point, women's clothing, women's dresses had always been extremely long skirts, skirts that went all the way to the ground. Sometimes they even drag, uh, would drag the ground. Um, but from, from the 1870s through uh, the 1920s, we see the hemline of a woman's dress uh, shorten drastically. Uh, first, it comes up to about the ankle so that as women are walking on the streets of the town and that, their hem. Uh, the hem of their dress is not getting too dirty uh, because the streets were full of mud and, and um, animal manure. Um, and, and so uh, as women became uh, more prominent out in public, their hemline came up to about the ankle so that uh, they, it wouldn't get dirty when walking on the street. And then as, uh, as they continue working in factories and, and as their jobs uh, continue to change and, and, and their lifestyles and things like that begin to change, we see the hemline continuing to come up until by the 1920s, the hemline on a woman's dress is generally right around the knee. Um, that is a huge change in probably less than 60 or 70 years. Um, money issues probably have to do with that as well because the, the ability to afford the fabric to make the clothes uh, would have changed significantly over the time. Um, but we, we can, uh, it's just an example of how you can look to fashion to see the reflection of the historical time period. Many women became domestic workers. Um, they, before the turn of the century, they were maids or nannies. Um, and they would do that up until the time they got married. Um, by 1870, 70% of the women that were employed were actually servants within the home. 
but opportunities increased as cities grew. And by 1900, one out of every five women worked. Um, they, a lot of them worked in the garment trade. Again, this particular picture is not from the time period. This is a more modern picture. Um, it's also of um, Asian ladies working in the garment industry. Um, but the garment industry was a very popular industry for women to be involved in sewing. Um, they also worked in offices, stores, and classrooms. Many of the leading progressive reformers were actually women. They became involved in politics. And one of the greatest accomplishments that they're going to achieve during this time is going to be the women's right to vote um, in 1920. It's gonna be another one of the constitutional amendments. Middle and upper class women entered the public sphere as reformers. Uh, lower class women entered the public sphere simply as workers. They didn't have time to get involved in reforms in politics. But middle class and upper class women had a lot of time on their hands. Um, and so they could get involved in these um, movements. Um, and many of the women that got involved in these movements had graduated from women's colleges. Um, so they were better educated. So I mentioned uh, the woman's right to vote. It's called women's suffrage. Um, and there was a three-part strategy for winning this right. Um, first, they had to convince state legislatures to allow women to vote. And uh, they actually succeeded in Wyoming, Utah, Idaho, and Colorado first. Um, once they got the state right to vote, um, they also took cases to court. Um, using the 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment had given universal suffrage to um, uh, all citizens of the United States. Um, now, it had been aimed at giving the right to vote to former slaves, to blacks. Um, but the women were using the 14th Amendment and testing it in the courts, saying that it should apply to women as well as men. And then they also pushed for a national constitutional amendment because if they were not able to succeed with the state legislatures and if the courts um, struck down their argument based on the 14th Amendment, what the courts in the states could not do would be ignore a constitutional amendment saying that women had the right to vote. So this is a map that shows you uh, which states allowed women to vote before 1920. You can see most of them were in the far west. You have a few, uh, New York and Michigan, that are uh, not in the far west, but most of them are in uh, the territory that we received after the Mexican-American War. A few, Kansas and Oklahoma, would have been before the Mexican-American War. Okay, the most prominent face or name of the progressive era is going to be Theodore Roosevelt. Um, he is known as being a rough rider. He is known for being president. Uh, he has a huge uh, reputation. Um, many of you know him from the movies Night at the Museum, Robin Williams played him. Um, he grabbed national attention by advocating war with Spain in 1898. He had actually been vice president. Um, and he advocated war with Spain um, because of several different things. Um, he had, um, America was trying to become more imperialistic. Uh, it wanted colonies like it was seeing the rest of Europe doing. Um, there had been some issues in Cuba. With Cuba wanted to be free of Spain. It was advantageous to America for Cuba to be free of Spain. And so, um, we actually embarked upon the Spanish-American War. Um, the Spanish-American War comes about for um, three reasons, but let me back up just a little bit and talk to you about uh, international expansion at the time. Uh, U.S. foreign policy goals in the late 19th, early 20th century um, were threefold. They, um, which means there were three goals. They wanted to defend, we wanted to defend the Western Hemisphere from intervention by Europe, but keep good relations with Europe. We wanted to create new economic opportunities and markets with other countries, and we wanted to extend our territory. And we wanted to do that through purchase, annexation, or conquering, if we needed to, colonization. 
Um, so there had been several instances of this um, in the 1860s. France, Great Britain, and Spain had sent soldiers to Mexico uh, to make Mexico repay some debts. Uh, Mexico repaid those debts, and Britain and Spain left, but France didn't. Napoleon III, Napoleon's uh, nephew, who had taken over France, had put Maximilian I um, in as the Mexican ruler. Um, America had protested, but America was busy with the Civil War, and so really didn't do anything. But after the war... Um, America sent 50,000 troops to the Rio Grande and issued an ultimatum to France. They said, get your French troops out of Mexico. Um, they did this based on the Monroe Doctrine, which said that the European powers were not allowed to interfere in any of the nations in the Western Hemisphere. France actually withdrew their troops and their support of Maximilian. Maximilian is captured by the Mexicans and he's executed. Um, that's the first issue, our first instance of America exercising some sort of imperialist, imperialistic intent. Um, then there's the Treaty of Washington in 1871, and it settles three matters that have been ongoing. Um, there's three separate tribunals. Uh, each tribunal settles one matter that had been ongoing for many years. The first one says that the U.S. can have $15 million for commerce raiders that had occurred by Britain during the Civil War. So the U.S. would be compensated um, $15 million for the damages that commerce raiders had done during the Civil War from Britain. Second one said that the Vancouver Islands would belong to the U.S., not Great Britain. The Vancouver Islands are off of Canada, and, and the tribunal said that the U.S. would have possession of those, not Britain. And the third would be that the U.S. would have to pay Canada for uh, $5 million, over $5 million, to have fishing rights and privileges off of the Canadian coast. Now, none of these seem really big to us now, but they did pave the way for much smoother, better relations between the United States, Britain, and Canada. And so it kind of soothed the issues to the north. In addition, in 1854, uh, the U.S. wanted to create a relationship with Japan. Japan had been closed off to the rest of the world, but the U.S. sent Commodore Matthew Perry and a small fleet of warships to negotiate trade with Japan. Japan was awed by the steamships brought over by Commodore Perry, um, and this resulted in the Treaty of Kanagawa, which opened Japanese ports to America. Um, this is going to be a, a huge triumph for the United States because no other country had been able to get Japan to open its, its borders or open its doors to American trade. And then there was the idea of Pan-Americanism, which is this idea where there would be greater cooperation and unity amongst the nations of the Western Hemisphere. North, Central, and South America would really trade with each other and be closer economically. Um, and the United States was really interested in this because they saw Latin America as having a lot of raw materials, a lot of food items, but not a lot of industry. So it was a great market for U.S. goods. Um, it increased trade uh, between the Americans, tried to decrease trade between the Americas and Europe. It wasn't very successful, though, because of the Mexican-American War. There were still a lot of hard feelings from that. Um, there was also this idea of um, getting into the competition for China. China um, was um, a huge market. Many countries in Europe and in Japan wanted to at least have a sphere of influence in China. The United States wanted to be in on that competition. But in 1899, our Secretary of State, John Hay, proposed the open door policy. It, it would allow all the nations trading in China, uh, they would allow free trade with China and not try and interfere each other's trade. Um, it actually worked really well um, for the other nations, and so they agreed to it. Um, China wasn't real thrilled with it, however, and the Boxer Rebellion happened, where uh, citizens uh, it involved attacked everything that was foreign, missionaries, um, businesses, everything. Um, but the revolt wound, winds up being crushed by a combination of Japanese, U.S., and European forces. This is a time of imperialism in the rest of the world, and the United States has, has to decide whether they want to get involved in it. And, and there were some pros and cons for imperialism. Um, 
Pros included better medical treatment, uh, better development of natural resources, improvements in education, uh, better roads, bridges, and railroads, and the gospel being carried to these nations um, that would be colonized. But the cons would be that um, the weaker nations were being exploited by the stronger nations. Weaker nations lost land, they lost independence, and they lost their identity. During this time of imperialism, uh, the United States engages in some of it um, using the three methods we talked about, purchasing uh, land, um, uh, conquering land, and um, the third one, I'm sorry, uh, the third one was um, annexing land. So uh, in 1867, we purchased land. We, uh, we purchased Alaska from Russia. It's called Seward's Folly. Seward was the Secretary of State. He negotiated the deal. Uh, Alaska is thought to be worthless. And so uh, purchasing Alaska from Russia for millions of dollars seemed to be a foolish idea. So it was called Seward's Folly. However, it turned out to be a great purchase because we found out that Alaska was rich in oil and gold. And in 1959, Alaska becomes the 49th state. We also start to expand into the Pacific um, area. Uh, the U.S. wants to build a specific empire. And in 1867, we simply annex the Midway Islands. They were uninhabited. Nobody really fussed. They made a good uh, naval base for us, and so we just took them. Um, Hawaii was a different um, Different case, however. It had been a supply point for whalers, merchant ships, and warships um, for many years, since the 1700s. Uh, in the 1800s, American missionaries had carried the gospel there and had been pretty successful. And up until 1891, the kings in Hawaii had been cooperative with American business interests and American businessmen. But in 1891, a queen took so a takes over, and there's no way I'm going to pronounce her name correctly, so I'm going to call her Queen Lil. That's actually what many people called her at the time. Queen Lil um, took over, took the throne, and she wanted to give control back to the natives. Uh, she wanted to limit the power of the Americans. By 1893, the business owners were not happy, and they began to revolt. Um, the U.S. actually sends the Marines in to help the American business leaders, and the Queen is overthrown. Um, Hawaii actually wants to be annexed to the United States immediately, or the businessmen who are running Hawaii at the time want to be annexed, but um, the President is not really sure about that. He doesn't think it's a really good idea, and so for several years, Hawaii uh, exists as an independent nation. Um, but in 1898, we do annex Hawaii, and in 1959, it becomes our 50th state. Now that brings us to the Spanish-American War, which is where Teddy Roosevelt and the Rough Riders come in. There are three main causes for the Spanish-American War. The first is yellow journalism. Yellow journalism is sensationalized reporting. It's the exact opposite of the muckrackers we talked about. It influenced American opinion in favor of war. Um, and an example of what we mean by yellow journalism is William Randolph Hearst was one of the big journalists of the time, and he was a huge yellow journalist. He owned a, uh, a uh, newspaper at the time, and he, um, he said to a reporter one time, or to a, to a photographer one time, um, he said, you supply, you furnish the pictures, I'll furnish the war. In other words, he said, you just send me the pictures. I'll write the story about the pictures. You don't have to give me the correct story. Okay, so Spanish-American War. This is where Teddy Roosevelt comes in, the Rough Riders. Um, we we're talking about how yellow journalism contributed to it. The second cause of the Spanish-American War is the DeLone Letter. The DeLone letter is a letter that the Spanish ambassador, DeLone, wrote, um, and in it he called President McKinley weak and a bitter for the admiration of the crowd. Now, this was not the worst thing that had been said about the United States president. Uh, many people in the United States had said far worse about him, but they had been citizens of the United States. This was the first time that um, it had become public that a foreign dignitary had said something unkind or insulting about the United States president. 
and people, the, the citizens, were highly insulted by this. Um, the third cause, and really the catalyst that began the fighting, was the sinking of the USS Maine. Um, in February 15th of 1898, the USS Maine exploded in the Cuban harbor. It had been sent there by the U.S. because tensions had been rising, and it just blows up in the Cuban harbor. 260 Americans are killed, and in all honesty, nobody really knows why it blew up. There was an investigation. At that time, nobody knew why it blew up. Uh, later on in the 1970s, there was an investigation into it, and it was determined that there was something internal that happened in the ship that caused it to blow up. Uh, several decades later, there was another investigation done, and it said, well, no, it actually could have been fired upon. Um, so we really don't know how or why the main blew up. We just know it blew up. Um, but it was very easy for everybody to believe because of the yellow journalism, the DeLome letter, the, the tensions of the time. It was very easy to believe that Spain had blown up the United States ship and killed 260 Americans. So uh, as a result of this, war begins between the United States and Spain um, on April 20th, 1898. Now it's not a long war. It only lasts about four months. Um, the major battles are the Battle of Manila Bay. This actually takes place in the Philippines, and that's how the United States gains the Philippines. America and Spain engage in a naval battle in Manila Bay. The Americans win and destroy the Spanish fleet there and gain the Philippines. And we're going to hold on to the Philippines um, for quite some time, several decades. Um, Santiago is another battle, and on May 19th, the Spanish fleet enters the harbor of Santiago. The Americans blockade that harbor um, and then send, America, uh, send army troops to capture Santiago and uh, force the Spanish out. San Juan Hill is fought in San Diego. So the Battle of San Juan Hill, the really famous battle that Teddy Roosevelt and the Rough Riders are involved in, is fought in the Battle of San, uh, San, Santiago. Teddy Roosevelt had resigned as vice president. He had volunteered as a Rough Rider. He had other guys, other men that he had recruited to go with him. Um, incidentally, he's the only one who had a horse at the time. The other Rough Riders were waiting on their horses to get there. But they charged the fortifications on San Juan Hill. It's a, a marvelous display of courage and bravery. Um, and it becomes very, uh, Teddy Roosevelt and his Rough Riders become extremely popular. Um, his cal cavalry um, wins public acclaim, accolades uh, for its role in the Battle of San Juan Hill. He's turned into a hero. He later elected, um, sorry, he wasn't vice president at the time. He's a volunteer rough rider before being vice president. He's elected as governor of New York, which leads to him becoming the vice president later on. Um, Santiago is, is surrendered in July, uh, uh, on July 17th. Puerto Rico is captured shortly thereafter by the U.S. And um, the Spanish-American War comes to an end. Uh, the U.S. gains Puerto Rico, Guam, and the Philippines in the war. It pays Spain $20 million for the Philippines. Um, it virtually rules Cuba for years. Uh, during this time, uh, it's actually the, the tensions and pressure building up uh, for the Spanish-American War that, that really uh, instigates McKinley going on and annexing Hawaii. The U.S. becomes a world power, becomes recognized as a world power, and has now amassed its own empire. This is a huge uh, deal for the United States. This is a picture of Teddy Roosevelt and his Rough Riders. This is Roosevelt right here. Okay, so Roosevelt uh, gets elected as governor of New York. He eventually becomes uh, vice president to President William McKinley, but President McKinley is assassinated six months into his second term. And when he is assassinated, um, Teddy Roosevelt becomes the nation's 26th president. <clears throat> He's going to give everybody a square deal. He believes everybody deserves a square deal. This is his name, his name for uh, everybody just getting uh, what they deserve, getting, getting what's fair. He becomes the youngest president ever at age 42. He establishes himself as a modern president 
who can influence the media and shape legislation. His Square Deal is a domestic program that really hones in, targets the middle class. He wants to get rid of trusts, or we would call them monopolies now, while protecting business from um, unorganized labor. So he, he's got a lot of ideas about what needs to be done. Trust busting becomes one of the biggest things that he's known for. Um, by 1900, trusts were legal bodies created to hold stock in many companies, and they controlled 80% of U.S. industries. It was a way to have a monopoly without it actually being a monopoly. Roosevelt saw it for what it was. He filed 44 antitrust suits under the Sherman Antitrust Act. Um, the railroad industry was, um, had been regulated by the Elkins Act and the Hepburn Act. I'm going to talk to you about those in just a minute to help break up their trust. The Hepburn Act was uh, from 1906. It was railroad legislation. It was the most important railroad le legislation. It strengthened the Interstate Commerce Commission's ability to set rates for the railroad. It standardized bookkeeping positions so that competition was more fair. Um, so that was a huge regulation on the railroad industry. They couldn't just uh, choose what rates they were going to charge willy-nilly. There, there was a standardization to it so that railroads could fairly compete with each other. Okay, in 1902, there was the Anthrite Coal Strike. Uh, 140,000 coal mar miners in Pennsylvania went on strike. They wanted in increased wages, they wanted a nine-hour workday, and they wanted the right to unionize. Mine owners had refused to bargain, and this is the first time that the United States government actually gets involved in a, um, in a dispute, in a, in a um, union organized labor dispute. Roosevelt calls in both sides to settle the dispute. He says he has the ability to do this because of the impact that this uh, coal has on the American people. After that, when a strike threatened the public welfare, the federal government was expected to step in and help. So Roosevelt actually sets this precedent. He said, the public welfare is being affected by coal not being mined. Both of you sides are going to have to get in here and come to an agreement so we can get this coal mine so that you're not adversely affecting the other American people. And he sets the precedent for presidents to do this in the future. Uh, government regulation comes about um, in the Pure Food and Drug Act of 1906. The Pure Food and Drug Act outlaws interstate sale of impure, impure food and drugs. And it requires honest labeling of all food and drugs. In addition, the Meat Inspection Act of 1906 gives the Department of Agriculture oversight over the preparation and packaging of meat and the ability to inspect animals before they're slaughtered. This was done to benefit the public and increase the public's confidence in the quality of food and drugs that they were consuming. And it had the potential to increase sales. All of this is primarily the result of a book by Upton Sinclair called The Jungle. Upton Sinclair, um, some could say he's a muckracker. This is a novel. So it's not, it's not an actual article. It's a, it's a novel. Um, and it highlights the unclean or unsafe practices of the meat packaging industry. Um, nasty things were happening. The, the, the uh, factories were... Um, were overridden by vermin, by mice, um, and so when meat was being packed, um, feces was getting packed into the, the meat. Um, it was a very uh, dangerous process, meat packing was, and sometimes people would um, cut themselves or cut off uh, fingers or and, and that would just get packed in with the meat, and there was, was all kinds of nastiness that was going on. Um, and, and it gets exposed in this novel by Upton Sinclair, and people start reading it and realizing just how uh, unregulated and how dangerous this industry can, uh, can be for the American people. So Roosevelt come, becomes aware of this, and he pushes for the passage of the Meat Inspection Act of 1906, 
which mandates cleaner conditions for the meat packing plants. Now, the, and the Pure Food and Drug Act, as I said, um, it, it mandates that there be truth in advertising. You can see here they were selling cocaine toothache drops. Now, actually, that wasn't the problem. The problem wasn't that it had cocaine in it. They thought that cocaine had really good medicinal value at the time. But at, before this act, products could claim anything, and they didn't have to live up to what they were saying. Um, and so the Food and Drug Administration is created, and con the sale of contaminated food and medicines is stopped, and, and people have to start um, being truthful in their advertising. Okay, Roosevelt and the environment. He was a huge environmentalist. Um, not to the point like we have today, um, but he loved the outdoors. He, he loved the land and, and conserving. He thought that it should be conserved for all of posterity. Uh, the federal government paid very little attention to the nation's natural resources before Roosevelt, and he thought that that was a problem. Um, so he made conservation a primary concern of his administration, um, and he actually set aside millions of acres of land um, as federal reserves, as places that where the resources and the land itself had to be preserved um, for future generations to enjoy. Uh, he sets aside 148 million acres of forest, and 1.5 million acres of water-powered sites. He also established 50 water life sanctuaries in several national parks. Um, so he has a huge impact there. Incidentally, um, President Taft, who follows him, sets aside more land than Roosevelt did. But Roosevelt is the first to do it, so he's the one who's known for it. Now, Roosevelt does not support civil rights for African Americans. Um, Racial relations, racial issues during Roosevelt's uh, presidency and during the progressive time um, was, was not at the top of their list. Um, discrimination and injustice was one of the great, greatest failures of the progressive era. Discrimination actually worsens during this time. Um, San Francisco begins the uh, segregation of Asian students into separate public schools. Black, <clears throat> blacks in the South start to see advancements that they had made during the Reconstruction era disappear with Jim Crow laws in the 1890s. Um, <clears throat> and there were several reasons for this change. One, the Redeemer politicians that had gained power after uh, the Civil War and during Reconstruction, they start to lose power to racist po uh, politicians. Another reason is that blacks begin to align themselves with the populist movement, and which scares a lot of conservatives. So conservative Democrats want to take the vote away from the blacks. Um, and then the third reason is that the national government and the northern uh, public have lost interest in civil rights and, and in protecting them. Um, now, Roosevelt did support a few individuals, like Booker T. Washington. Booker T. Washington and uh, W.E.B. Du Bois had two opposing ideas on uh, this issue of civil rights. Booker T. Washington said that um, blacks needed to concentrate on bettering themselves through education, especially vocational education, and then establishing black businesses and trades. And once the blacks were able to increase their economic power, whites would have no choice but to create... Uh, accept them as equals. So he favored an economic solution. W.E.B. Du Bois said that blacks couldn't improve until they were treated as equal, and he sought a political solution, and he formed the NAACP, which is the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Um, and uh, in 1909, a number of African Americans and, and prominent white reformers uh, formed the NAACP, specifically W.E.B. Du Bois had a hand in this. It had 6,000 members by 1914, and the goal was full equality among the races. Um, and they thought that they could achieve this through the court system. The NAACP still exists today. Okay, so after two... Uh, terms, Roosevelt says he's not going to run again. 
Uh, everybody is still following that precedent set by Washington. Two terms was the limit, um, and, and Teddy Roosevelt is going to adhere to that. Uh, but he does handpick his successor. He had been good friends with William Howard Taft, and he tapped Taft to be the next president. Now, William Howard Taft's goal in life had never been to be president. He really wanted to be Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. The judiciary was the branch of government that he was interested in. But Roosevelt talked to him and, and tried to and, and convince Taft that he should run for president. Taft does run for president, and he easily defeats William Jennings Bryan, who runs again in the 1908 election. Um, and he actually is a bigger trust buster than Roosevelt was. He goes about busting 90 trusts during his one term of office. <clears throat> However, Taft is not popular with the American people or the reformed Republicans. And by 1910, Democrats had regained control of the House of Representatives. Um, Taft is also going to lose the support of Teddy Roosevelt. Um, Taft's person, uh, sorry, Taft had favored a lower tariff. Congress denies that. Uh, his support, he had supported reigning in the Speaker of the House, um, whose name was Cannon at the time, and he, he supported the efforts within the House of Representatives to rein in that speaker, and that had been successful. Um, but tensions had begun to build between Taft and Gifford Pinchot, who was the U.S. Forest Service Director, and that had been over the conservation of land. Taft had a very strict interpretation of the conservation laws. Uh, Pinchot and, and actually Roosevelt had had uh, a broader definition of those laws. And th so that caused some tension um, between Taft and Pinchot first, and because of that, between Taft and Roosevelt. And then more uh, tension comes about between Taft and Roosevelt um, over antitrust proceedings. When Roosevelt had been president, he had approved a deal uh, for uh, U.S. Steel to purchase the Tennessee Coal and Iron Company. Um, Taft is going to see that as a trust and something that needs to be busted up. Because he attacks the U.S. Steel Trust, um, Roosevelt sees that as a direct attack on himself uh, because he had approved the deal. Um, so, in the 1912 election, it's going to be a three-party election. Roosevelt has come back from a trip to Africa. He's found out what's going on with Taft. He and Taft have had this split. Uh, during the campaign for this election, there's actually going to be a time when a reporter comes in to, uh, to interview Taft in his train car, and he finds Taft sitting with his, hand, with his head in his hands crying, and he said, Roosevelt used to be my friend. Uh, this really tore Taft up. But Taft gets the Republican nomination for re-election. Um, Roosevelt had actually tried to get the Republican nomination, um, but Taft gets it, um, and Roosevelt responds by forming the Bull Moose Party. The Bull Moose Party uh, nominates Roosevelt as their presidential candidate, and the Democrats nominate Woodrow Wilson, who had been uh, New Jersey governor. Um, it's a three-party race. Anytime we see a three-party race, the party that splits is always going to lose. And it was the Republican Party that had split, so both uh, Taft and Roosevelt lose the election, and Woodrow Wilson becomes president. This is the Electoral College uh, vote, voters map. And Woodrow Wilson becomes the new president. The Progressive Era sees three presidents. Um, the three presidents are uh, Roosevelt, Taft, and Woodrow Wilson. Woodrow Wilson is America's newly elected president, and he wants to enact his program called New Freedom. Roosevelt's program had been called the Square Deal. Uh, Wilson's program is going to be called New Freedom. He had planned to attack what he called the triple wall of privilege, which was trust, tariffs, and high finance. Um, and this is what Wilson wants to accomplish during his presidency. Um, 
1914, Congress enacts the Clayton Antitrust Act, which actually strengthens the Sherman Antitrust Act. And it prevents companies from acquiring stock from another company. Um, it also supports union workers. So it gives a little bit more teeth to the Sherman Antitrust Act. And this ha happens in Wilson's um, presidency. Also, the Federal Trade Commission is formed. It's formed in 1914 as a watchdog agency to make sure that unfair business practices are ended and that consumers are protected from business fraud. The federal income tax arrives. Um, the 16th Amendment had been rat was ratified in 1916 and creates a graduated federal income tax. You'll remember this is one of the things that the populist movement really wanted. This and the direct election of senators were two of the big things that the populist movement really wanted, um, and they get done during the progressive era with constitutional amendments. The Federal Reserve Act is also created. Um, there was discussion um, about what needed to happen economically. Um, and so the Federal Reserve Act of uh, addresses the panic, financial panic of 1907. Um, the financial panic of 1907 had caused a lot of American businessmen to want a better system of regulating uh, currency and banking practices. They actually favored um, a national bank models similar to what Alexander Hamilton had first set up and Jackson had destroyed, Andrew Jackson had destroyed. Wilson and the conservatives came up with the Federal Reserve. It's actually kind of a compromise between private and government ownership uh, of a bank. And so the Federal Reserve Act of 1913 set up 12 banking industries, uh, I'm sorry, 12 banking districts. Each district was served by a private regional Federal Reserve Bank, but all of those banks were overseen by the Federal Reserve Board the members of the reserve of, of the Fed, the Federal Reserve Board, um, are actually um, appointed by the president and confirmed by Congress. Um, this was a compromise between private and government system, and they came up with a new form of currency. Uh, they were going to regulate currency through interest rates, um, and they came up with a new form of currency, which was called the Federal Reserve Note. Also, uh, in 1920, the 19th Amendment is um, ratified and added to the Constitution, and it gives women the right to vote. Native-born, educated, middle-class women uh, became more and more impatient uh, with getting the right to vote, um, and they continued to push even through World War I, and finally in 1920, they were able to gain the right to vote. Temperance, uh, the temperance movement gives way to the prohibition movement and the 18th amendment is added to the constitution which prohibits the sale, distribution, and transporta uh, um, transportation of alcohol. It does not outlaw the or prohibit the consumption of alcohol, but you can't sell it and you can't transport it. So if you can find it, you can drink it, but you can't make it, and you can't sell it. Um, it's ratified on January 29th of 1919, and it's the only U.S. state's constitutional amendment that has been repealed. It's going to be repealed later on by the 21st Amendment, because it didn't work. And actually what it does, it had been, um, it had been meant to um, stifle sales and business. It actually increased sales and business, uh, but on the black market, and it created such things as uh, the mafia. Um, it created such things as um, bootleggers, um, and it um, also created NASCAR because when the bootleggers were trying to run from the revenuers or, or from the prohibition people, um, they had to um, have really fast cars. But when they weren't transportating, trans 
reporting the moonshine, uh, they wanted to see whose car was faster. And um, they would race each other, and that's where NASCAR came from. No joke. Um, so the Progressive Era was responsible for a lot of important reforms, but it does not make gains for African Americans. Their plight actually gets worse during this time. Civil rights was probably the biggest failure of the Progressive Era. And the KKK actually reach its, reaches a membership uh, level of 4.5 million people in the 1920s. The KKK actually becomes much more prevalent during the early 1900s, 1920s, 1930s, 1940s, than it was after the Civil War during Reconstruction. World War I brings an end to the Progressive Era. Um, mainly because we have to focus on fighting a war, and so everybody's um, attention turns to that. Okay, I told you at the end I would talk to you, I would summarize for you the four uh, constitutional amendments from the Progressive Era. They're called the Progressive Era Amendments or the Progressive Amendments. Um, we have talked about them in the PowerPoint. Um, however, um, we have talked about them at different times during the PowerPoint, so I just want to bring them all together right now. The 16th Amendment was for the federal income tax. Did we start? The 16th Amendment was for the federal income tax. Um, it was put in place for two reasons. Uh, to provide the government with funds for reforms and to expand social services. Um, it was a graduated tax, so the more you pay, the, uh, the more you made, the more you paid on the tax. The less you made, the less you paid. It was considered to be more fair that way. Um, and the funds went to um, replace the funds lost by lowering the tariffs. The 17th Amendment was the next one. It was the direct election of the U.S. Senators. Um, and it actually eliminated the safeguard by the Founding Fathers, allowing the states to have a voice in Congress the, uh, the Founding Fathers had originally said that state legislatures would elect the senators, giving them a voice in Congress. The 17th Amendment made the election of U.S. senators occur by popular vote. The people would be voting, uh, thus getting rid of or negating that safeguard. The Third Amendment is the 18th Amendment. The 18th Amendment is prohibition. It was the most controversial um, the idea is to eliminate liquor, and that would reduce crime and poverty, and it actually increases crime um, by bringing about the mafia boot and bootleggers, um, and then again, NASCAR, as, as I already said. It is going to be repealed by the 21st Amendment under the presidency of Franklin Roosevelt. And the fourth and final amendment uh, that is a progressive amendment is the 19th Amendment, and that is women's suffrage. Uh, the women's right to vote. That effort was led by Susan, Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, um, and it is finally achieved in 1920. I hope that this has helped you understand the Progressive Era more and the impact that it has on our nation today. Um, have a great afternoon.